Hi, this is Dr. Tom Rafai, host of Noted. That stands for News of the Day, brought to you by the True Health Initiative. Uh, we are proud to bring you the top in nutrition and lifestyle experts. Uh, and today we have the one and only Dr. Walter Willett, a professor of epidemiology and nutrition at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. And uh, let me just make this clear to just put the bio in perspective, the most cited nutrition researcher in human history. So you're going to be you're going to be getting some top level information here, Dr. Willett. Thank you so much for being part of Noted. Great to be with you, Tom. Thank you so much. Um, as as you know, we have uh, three topics we would like to discuss today. In particular, um, the uh, uh, processed added fiber controversy, and absolutely some uh, diving into Eat Lancet regarding both planetary and human health, and making those things uh, one. But I have to ask if we don't mind, since this third time is the charm, we've, we've actually really tried to get this to you even faster, everyone, but we're here today. The Starbucks story. May, may, I, may I ask you about, a bit about how you potentially played a role in, in making sure one of the biggest fast food outlets actually had something healthy on the menu with the Starbucks oatmeal? Well, thanks, and I'm glad we were able to help out a little bit. This evolved from a longstanding collaboration we have had with the Culinary Institute of America. And for many years, I think it's about 20 years, we've had an annual course that brings together people from the food service industry and nutritional scientists. And uh, we co-teach this course. Uh, uh, several of my colleagues and I in the Department of Nutrition at Harvard talk about the latest information, latest knowledge in nutrition and then the Culinary Institute puts it into practice. And uh, as you probably know, uh, until fairly recently, Starbucks really only had one item that was healthy on their menu, and that was coffee. Uh, and the rest of the stuff they had was like so much of what America eats, pretty much refined starch and sugar. And so we talked about uh, high fiber, whole grains, uh, and uh, Starbucks, uh, had a representative there, uh, and uh, they uh, came back the next year and uh, said they managed to put oatmeal and a few other whole grain items on their menu, and they were now their top sellers. I, I think uh, they were just missing out on an important part of the American market that does want to eat in a more healthy way, that drinks coffee uh, as part of that, and uh, there was just an audience waiting for them to have healthy options on, on their menu. So. Uh, it was just a little bit of information, I think, that uh, pointed them in a good direction, and they took advantage of it. Yeah, healthy lifestyle, even on the run, you know, we can uh, we can pull it off, but we need the help of of corporate America and voices like yourself break through to people like that. So I, I don't want to underestimate the importance of them listening to an expert like yourself and then manifesting it in something I actually order. Uh, I, I like the. Uh, the Starbucks. Um, I, I order it with extra nuts instead of the, the sugar and the dried fruit. Uh, and, and sometimes I tweak it with a little bit of uh, steamed nonfat milk, et cetera. But it's it's a great, simple, easy item. And, and thank you for it. And it contains, Dr. Willett, real fiber. Or, True fiber, yes. yes yeah, an, an actual intact, I should say, uh, unprocessed, not having to be added after the fact fiber. Yet, transitioning to this next topic, we have well, let me say for background, apparently many Americans believe that steak is a source of fiber. So we, have a, we, have a, we have a lot of work to do here, Dr. Willett. And nevertheless, when we look at ice creams and certain um, processed nutrition bars or having just ridiculously wonderful looking high fiber numbers, and uh, we, we go, hmm, is this too good to be true? Is it? Unfortunately, it's often not true. And often these items are promoted with a halo, a smiling, sunny face there, uh, really trying to make the point that this is a healthy food. But unfortunately now, the Food and Drug Administration allows food manufacturers to put into their products over 30 different types of synthetic or purified fiber. Uh, the problem is that in natural foods, the fiber part of the food, uh, usually in, in grains, for example, the bran, comes with most of the minerals and vitamins and phytochemicals. And so at, it's fiber is a marker in some sense, but at, when we have a natural food high in fiber, it means that there's gonna be plenty of nutritional components, health promoting nutritional components there that are not gonna be present 
in these synthetic and, and uh, purified fibers. Uh, for the Food and Drug Administration, all you have to do is show that your product uh, creates bigger bowel movements, and then you can call it a fiber and put it on the fiber line. And that's really misleading. So it, it, the FDA requires some tiny little health benefit, nowhere near in parallel the evidence we have for intact fibers that are in, naturally intact uh, in, in whole foods. Um, exactly. It, it's, uh, it, it, it's really misleading when these products are packed up with these, really it's cardboard, uh, cellulose will count as fiber there. And uh, you can then market it uh, as a health promoting food, in, but it has nowhere near the uh, natural benefits. Uh, you can be adding that to refined starch and sugar and sell it as a healthy high fiber food. It's really, truly misleading. So in preparation for this, I went and, and looked up the list of things on a label that could count as fiber. And I read things from maltodextrin to polydextrose to uh, uh, um, chicory root extract, which I find is their nice way of saying inulin. And I thought to myself, I don't want you to extract it from the root of something. I want you to leave it in the root. <laughs> Some people might, oh, chicory root extract. You've extracted it, turned it into pixie dust and sprinkled it on something else and pretended it could do the same thing. Um, so, you know, as the host, I maybe shouldn't show my card so much about how I feel about it, but I, I can't help but note there are many uh, uh, people I've treated as patients and, and coaching clients that uh, believe they are getting an equal level of benefit of eating fruits, vegetables, beans, lentils, peas, uh, whole grains, obviously, and, and nuts and seeds from something that has you know, 14 grams of fiber that all come from oligosaccharides or whatever else they purified and thrown on like dust. Uh, unfortunately, very misleading. Yes. Uh, now, with with that being um, with that being said, I think can we clarify some of the what I understand are some of the more really from I, I don't want to say the word pure to confuse, but from the world of intact fibers that come from again so everyone. It's very simple. Maybe it's not easy because of our environment, but whole fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, nuts, and seeds. This is this is a not a complicated list that we have a combination of uh, people who have higher intact fiber may excrete more calories than someone on a low fiber diet that in fecal uh, remains that there's a little bit of calories left over, but people who eat higher fiber may actually poop out some of them. So calories may be a calorie, but not if you don't absorb them. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, that's true. And I didn't mention it, but fiber in an intact brain also has a physical role too. It's basically making that grain like a slow release capsule of carbohydrate. And that can be really important. That can lower the glycemic index quite a bit. So instead of getting this whopping dose of uh, easily absorbed carbohydrate sugars and starches broken up into pure glucose, uh, uh, instead of getting that big peak of blood glucose and all the metabolic consequences of that, an intact whole grain is, uh, slowly releases the uh, the glucose the, the, and the starch and gives a much lower increase in blood sugar. So that's another additional reason. It's, uh, there, there actually is a physical role besides all the nutritional role, uh, roles that uh, a whole intact grains uh, bring along with them. So a, a slower digestion, um, great marker for vitamins and minerals, which couldn't be the case if it was processed, extracted from all those vitamins and minerals and antioxidants and thrown into something else. Uh, that slower digestion in preparation for this too, I, as you're mentioning, the slower digestion results in a sense, as we were talking about pooping out more calories, that when undigested food remnants make it all the way to the end of the 25 feet of small bowel, if the ileum recognizes that, it actually sends back more fullness hormones so that you're actually more satiated through that a fi intact fiber mechanism. More satiety, yes. And that actually is the food for the microbiome that lives in our large bowel. And we're seeing that that it plays an important role in health and well-being. We don't know all of the benefits. This is a very hot research area, but it's pretty clear that a healthy microbiome, not a starved microbiome, is uh, good for human health. Absolutely. So it's a kind of like fertilizer for healthy gut bacteria, maybe weed killer for unhealthy gut bacteria. Unfortunately so, yes. Something like that. And um, I guess la last but not least, because this might be a... a a, a nice transition to, um, to eat Lancet. Uh, the gut 
microbiome, I mean, there's really very few things I think that are really known versus all of the wonderful research, but clearly one is the intact fiber and, and getting it from a mix of, of minimally processed whole foods that we don't really have the evidence that processed fiber will in some singular processed source will do the same as in terms of gut microbiome. Is that fair? Uh, virtually for sure, it does not do the same because it, it just it simply doesn't have all the minerals and vitamins and uh, phytochemicals that come along with uh, natural fiber in, uh, as part of a food. Uh, for, again, for the FDA, there's only one of two things you have to show to get on the fiber line. That's that it causes larger bowel movements or it can reduce blood cholesterol levels, which does have some benefit uh, if you, uh, from some of these synthetic fibers, but you can have that plus a lot more benefit with, in fiber from the real food. So I guess we're, we're clarifying here that, you know, it's not necessarily harmful, but indirectly, if you're thinking that it's the same as getting it from a whole food, it could be harmful in that way. Uh, it absolutely can be harmful if you're misled to consume a product that's really low, primarily refined starch and sugar uh, in, instead of a whole food. Because of that high number on the fiber line, it, it really can be harmful, in fact. So I, I think in the, um, the copy that we'll include with this, Dr. Willow will unfortunately have to give some type of a list of what people can look for on a label when they see a number that's too good to be true, because as you have pointed out to me, the FDA uh, so far is not interested as they are with uh, clarifying how much added sugar there is to the total sugar. They're not going to be telling us anytime soon how much added fiber there is to the total fiber, sadly, is that right? Uh, yes, that's unfortunately true. The FDA actually is aware of this and they debated whether to have a separate line for synthetic or purified fiber uh, and they decided not to do that. It, it would have been far better, far uh, more informative, less misleading uh, to have that separated out. It's not that we have to totally ban these synthetic fibers, but because they, the way it's uh, part of the fiber line now it can be very misleading and in fact be harmful. So uh, maybe we can get another line there. Uh, as you say, uh, we already have the example of added sugar and it really, if it's gonna be allowed to be on the food label as contributing fiber, we really should separate it out. Because the evidence isn't there yet for equipoise. We can't say that it's equal and beneficial in health benefits. And so why not have that? I, uh, I think, uh, you have any guess as to uh, being realistic, um, We'll probably have to have people get smart about, you know, what names on an ingredients list or contribute to such massively high fiber numbers. But um, any could it be ten years before we might get to where it's uh, clarified on a label? How long might it be? Just a guess. Uh, these wheels turn slowly. I've come to realize, even when we had strong evidence that trans fat was harmful, it took about about uh, twenty years to get it on the label, and it took about thirty years to get it banned. Oh, okay. these things don't happen overnight. So I guess probably the easiest thing is if you really want to count your grams of fiber, think it should be coming from a whole fruit, vegetable, whole grain, bean, lentil, or pea, or of nuts or seeds. Is that? Uh, that's where it, those are the foods we should be eating. Yes. So be really careful about any processed food that uh, claims to have a lot of fiber in it. I would be extremely suspicious. You can sort of, if you really want to pick it apart, you can look down at the ingredient list. Uh, for some of these sort of uh, synthetic, fake or synthetic fibers, uh, but there are dozens of them that are allowed. So you really have to be pretty knowledgeable to figure this out, uh, looking at, at the food label. Yes. So, and, and, and no offense to pick us, there's many other products, but no, no offense to Dairy Queen, but if you're looking at a DQ fudge bar with five grams of fiber and you think that it's an apple, <laughs> no. Okay, so with, with that, excuse me, with that being said, um, in terms of eating more uh, of minimally processed plants, we know how healthy that is, uh, but there's for people, but there's also this, this juxtaposition with the health of the entire planet. And you helped lead a commission, um, Eat Lancet, that uh, would love to get some basics on, but essentially really tried to find out where it would be reasonable to have a balance between planetary health and human health uh, without torturing the world with some overly strict dietary approach and, and yet still have uh, carbon uh, emissions and the ability to maintain soil health 
it was, it's really, an, I think, an under, uh, under-recognized effort in terms of Eat Lancet. Could you give us some background in the history of the commission and the findings and the recommendations, please? Sure. Uh, I think for many years, uh, many people have been concerned about climate change and about health uh, all at the same time. Uh, uh, and uh, fortunately, a, a foundation in Sweden uh, called the Eat Foundation uh, was able to get funding. I worked with them a little bit uh, uh, and from the Welcome Trust. This is a large uh, charity in the United Kingdom uh, to bring together 35 scientists from 17 different countries around the world to take on the challenge. Uh, specifically, uh, we were asked to uh, see if it's possible and if so, how could we feed what will be by 2050, about 10 billion people in the world, a diet that is both healthy and sustainable. Uh, that sounds um, like a simple <laughs> challenge, but it is incredibly challenging because even at this time, we're not uh, feeding um, the vast majority of the world a healthy diet. And secondly, we are certainly not doing it sustainably at present. And we're gonna be adding, by the way, about 2.5 billion more people by 2050. So that is a, a enormous complex challenge. And I wasn't sure, I think none of us on the commission uh, was, were sure that we would be able to do that, that this, that this was even possible. So uh, we set up, this is a big complicated task and we sort of sat around scratching our heads for a while. How do we get our hands around this? How do we take on this challenge? So we broke it down into several steps. Uh, the first was to define a healthy diet. Uh, if we want to have a healthy diet, everybody agrees about that, but what does that mean exactly? Uh, and you need numbers on this if you're going to do the calculations about being able to feed 10 billion people. Uh, so we basically looked at the world's literature on diet and health. Uh, uh, fortunately, now uh, there, are, there is quite a literature. There wasn't 20 years ago about uh, what components of diet are, are important for maintaining a good, good health and what are actually adverse. So we uh, came up with uh, target numbers, uh, but also ranges, recognizing that uh, different people respond differently to different aspects of diet. And uh, the human body is remarkably flexible in terms of uh, uh, what we can eat. It's, it's pretty amazing. amazing. You, you, you need For a car, you need to run on one type of fuel, but we can we can operate on a variety of different fuels and, and that are uh, many of them similarly healthy. So we uh, came up with uh, the what we uh, identified as uh, target numbers or reference numbers, and they really describe uh, what has been called a, a flexitarian diet. Uh, it's not strictly vegan, uh, and we, we wanted to make the tent as big as possible so as many people could eat a healthy and sustainable diet. Uh, and we found uh, for, on the basis of health that a modest consumption of animal source foods uh, could be part of a healthy diet, uh, but you could be a vegan if you wanted to, although you will run into some um, vitamin deficiencies if you don't supplement, uh, for example, with vitamin B12. But uh, I won't go into all of the numbers, but it, in, in the, the bottom line of the definition of the healthy diet was one plus one. And that's not too complicated for most people. Uh, and in, that's in terms of the protein sources, which are particularly important because the protein sources make a big difference for health and for environment. So we, we spent a lot of time focusing on protein sources. So one plus one means one serving of dairy a day and one other animal source food like poultry, fish, uh, red meat, and, and eggs. Uh, and, and there's a lot of flexibility in that you don't have to have dairy, you don't have to have any of, any of these specific foods, there's some exchangeability, but uh, that one plus one allows, uh, I, I find that actually it's sort of how I think about my daily meals and it's really easy to do in fact. Uh, so, uh, but within that non-dairy source, uh, red meat was low. We do see uh, the worst adverse health outcomes for high red meat consumption, particularly processed meat, uh, but uh, we emphasized as protein sources, nuts, legumes, soy products, uh, which have positive health benefits. Uh, so there's, in general, this is shifting 
the US diet toward more plant-based, uh, but not to zero animal source foods for other parts of the world, and this was a global effort, uh, that could actually mean a small increase in uh, red meat, for example, if people wanted to do that. Uh, other parts of the world are pretty much at that, about one serving a week of, uh, of red meat. So uh, we can't say increase or decrease when you're looking at this globally. It really depends on where you're starting from. And that, of course, applies to individuals as well. So that was, I won't go through all the numbers. We could circle back if you wanted to. Uh, and uh, I am from the Midwest. Uh, dairy has uh, been in our family for generations and generations. So this is, seems like a lower number for dairy, but we could talk about that. Uh, and then we look to see if whether it was possible to consume this diet, uh, what we defined as a healthy diet sustainably. And there, uh, in that process, we took into account a whole literature on what's called life cycle analysis. What are the greenhouse gas emissions for each type of food? And also another area of science called planetary boundaries, which looks, tries to define how much greenhouse gas could we produce and do it sustainably? How much water? could we use sustainably? How much land could we use sustainably? Uh, and uh, through a, a statistical modeling, we found that uh, in fact, we could feed the world this diet uh, if we did it very carefully with uh, best agricultural practices uh, and also reducing food waste quite a bit. Uh, but the biggest single uh, if, uh, change or uh, uh, contribution to doing this uh, sustainably was the type of foods that we consume. Uh, and then you have to, again, have practice agriculture well, uh, reduce food waste. But uh, we, we could barely, and I should say we could barely scrape by doing this. It wasn't that there's a, lo a lot of room for error. We've got to do almost everything right to be able to feed the world a healthy and sustainable diet. But it's, but it's worth doing. Uh, uh, we're extremely off track in terms of climate change at the moment, we're headed for a complete disaster that will destroy human civilization uh, within the next hundred years, it seems, if we don't make major changes. So uh, there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, it will require the efforts of almost every citizen of the planet. But if we do it, there can also be massive improvements of health as well. We, it looks like we could reduce mortality rates by 20 or 25 percent, shifting to this healthier diet. And um, you mentioned uh, a couple of things that I'd like to expand a, a bit on. In terms of the, the flexibility, it is uh, at acknowledging of different cultures and therefore how it's applied across cultures is, was recognized. It might be edamame and in, 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 in Asia. It could be uh, uh, lentils and fava beans in the Middle East uh, and so on, et cetera. That, and that flexibility led you to the, the, the concept that I, you know, I mean, it, it was wor it was words that wore my heart. I am a flexitarian myself. I think we we talked about that and the uh, ability to go from vegan to a plant predominant flexitarian and different types of ethnicities was all recognized within the Eat Lancet Commission recommendations. Uh, but there is a strong need to reduce what is seems to be a, a really massive amount of food waste. What percentage of food ends up? Uh, well, you know, ultimately the source was healthy, if we consider it could have been an animal that was out at pasture, or it could have been a, a, a plant that wasn't so processed. So sometimes I might recommend someone after a party throw away some cake. Uh, but nevertheless, if we could get to the point of healthier eating and not waste as much food, bottom line, how much food is tossed out and never consumed at this point? Uh, that depends a lot on what part of the world you're looking at. Uh, we call this food loss and waste. Loss meaning what happens before it gets to the consumer. And in many parts of the world, particularly uh, Africa and uh, lower income countries, a lot of food is lost uh, because there's not a good supply chain in terms of preservation of food, uh, uh, keeping it from getting moldy, keeping it from rotting, uh, 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 lack of transportation, uh, food handling. So in uh, those countries, there's uh, most of the loss, most of the loss and waste is lost. Uh, and in America, uh, there's both loss and waste, but the biggest part of it is waste. Uh, in Africa, there's almost no food waste that people do consume every little bit of food that's available. 
Uh, here in the United States, we uh, waste is about 40% of the food that uh, becomes available to Americans. Uh, uh, globally, it's uh, food loss and waste is about 30%. Uh, if we could cut that in, we're never going to be able to completely eliminate it. If we could, the goal would be to cut it in half. Uh, uh, so that's going to require a lot of effort. But uh, again, the effort will depend on the country, the facilities for preserving food. Uh, but also, we, we do have a tremendous amount of food waste in this country, food that's uh, good, available, enters the home, and is, is thrown out. Uh, so again, we're not going to make that zero, but there's uh, 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 clearly the need for a lot of attention to that part of the picture. So big takeaways for, for America, at least, in, in terms of the recommendations, clearly, and maybe we can pick out each one of these, you know, where we are at now for fruit and vegetable, and, and I would, you know, say let's, maybe we you can answer it as you wish, fruit and vegetable or fruit, vegetable, legume, whole grain, where are we at now, where would we need to be um, is it basically a doubling to maybe tripling of plant intake and a having of animal food intake? What would what, what are some big takeaways that could translate to how they uh, our watchers could make this actionable starting tomorrow? Uh, you're absolutely right that uh, these target numbers, these goals mean actual increases in many important food uh, food groups: uh, fruits, vegetables, nuts, whole grains, uh, fish. Uh, all would increase to be able to reach the target numbers. Uh, on the decrease side, uh, red meat would need to come down by about two thirds. Uh, that's quite a reduction. Uh, uh, dairy would decrease a little bit. Actually, the recommended, as you know, the recommended number by USDA is three servings a day. Uh, the actual intake by Americans is about 1.6 servings a day. So. What, what they're recommending is, in fact, a radical change, uh, doubling dairy production in the United States, uh, if we really believe that our guidelines were right, would mean a massive environmental impact. Uh, the environmental impact of dairy is already pretty big. But uh, it, uh, in the United States, it would be a little bit of a decrease in dairy, not large. Uh, some decrease, uh, and we uh, have a little uh, discussion about that sometimes, a little bit of decrease in potatoes, shifting more toward other kinds of uh, vegetables. Uh, so uh, again, it's uh, sh shifting in the direction of a healthy plant-based diet, but not necessarily, be, uh, definitely not, meaning that everybody has to become a vegan. Um, but a couple, couple of, uh, uh, of, of things there. Some people might hear the, um, the dairy part and, and would we also say maybe a, the quality of our dairy could possibly shift maybe a little less of the higher saturated fat and salty processed cheese versus yogurts and uh, maybe uh, you know, dairy products that are maybe skimmer or lower in fat, whatever the case may be, but the type of dairy, is there anything to be said in, in, that, uh, in that realm? Uh, that's, that's true. There does seem to be some health benefit of yogurt uh, in many studies. That's I think not definitive, but uh, in many studies we see some advantages, uh, some health benefits of yogurt. Uh, we didn't focus on low fat or high fat dairy. The reality is that fat always gets consumed. Uh, and so in a big picture, uh, low fat dairy has no benefit on, on health uh, because uh, uh, in fact, the dairy industry loves low fat dairy because they take out the fat, sell it to some people as low fat dairy and to other people they sell it as ice cream and cream uh, or butter. Uh, and so it's a sort of a double win for the, Zero the dairy industry. Uh, so. Uh, we haven't focused on, on low fat or high fat too much. Uh, and if you're only having one serving a day, the reality is, is it doesn't matter too much whether it's low fat or high fat. If we're having higher amounts of dairy, then that starts to become uh, more important. And I should add, uh, if people want to drink more of a white liquid per day, it's part of our culture. It's a little bit strange. Most of the world doesn't drink white liquids all their life. Uh, uh, but uh, there are a lot of uh, many plant-based milk alternatives now. And uh, soy is actually, I, in terms of a nutritional profile, actually looks pretty good because okay. it's got a modest amount of healthy fat in it there, omega-3 fatty acids, uh, quite, a, quite a good amount. Uh, and all of these products are actually fortified with to produce, provide about the same amount of calcium and uh, 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 potassium as actual milk 
they're all fortified with vitamin D and vitamin A. Re regular milk, uh, cow's milk is fortified that way too. So fortification is not, not something new. Uh, uh, so these uh, milk alternatives are pretty good choices. I've also uh, tried one of the oat milk, uh, a couple of the oat milk products there, and they're actually remarkably, uh, I actually don't enjoy cow's milk so much anymore. I, I drank five glasses a day growing up because we were told to do that in Michigan, Wisconsin. But um, uh, the oat milk was a, a very pleasant product, only had about 50 calories per glass, which should be um, lower even than skim milk. So uh, again, lots of, the good thing is we have lots of alternatives if people want to uh, have a look and feel of what they've been doing uh, over the years. So I, I'm personally a big fan of unsweetened soy milk. I agree with you. I'm a great potassium to sodium ratio. There's even a little fiber. I think it would probably be better to chew it, but it's not processed added. It's a residual of the of the soybeans, edamame, if you will, that was made into milk. And I think it tastes great. I um, I, I admit sometimes I mix uh, a little bit of uh, you know, skim milk with the, with the, with it to, to, we, and, and in terms of weaning, I think that's just another point. You can, you don't have to go from zero to hundred miles an hour. You can kind of mix and blend and dilute. Absolutely. And dilute. Can we debunk the, the issues regarding soy and maybe separate processed pro, soy protein and whatever from edamame and, and tempeh and tofu and, and even unsweetened soy milk, because I'm sure there are many that will say that, but that's going to give you breast cancer, for instance. Right. And by the way, thank you for pointing out that these milk alternatives should be the unsweetened versions that if, uh, some of them do have a lot of sugar. So uh, be careful of that. Uh, uh, yes, there had been, I think, real concern that high consumption of soy products might have some adverse effects on hormones, be, uh, on breast cancer and some hormonally related uh, cancers, because soy products do contain phytoestrogens. And we know that estrogens will increase risk of breast cancer if we consume them for a long period of time. But these phytoestrogens are weak estrogens and they could actually compete with the natural estrogens that women produce uh, and therefore block the natural estrogens. Uh, that would be acting like the drug tamoxifen that we use uh, for actually preventing breast cancer or treating breast cancer. Uh, we've uh, and until recently, we didn't have much human data on this because the consumption of soy in the United States has been pretty low until recently. But uh, in Asia, of course, many populations have consumed high amounts of soy. And uh, what's been seen is that uh, there, uh, in these more recent studies, it looks like soy consumption, uh, as you say, that it's like in the form of tempeh or, or tofu, uh, especially during young adulthood and adolescence, actually seems to reduce breast cancer risk. So it looks like it's acting more like the tamoxifen side of um, estrogens or these phytoestrogens and probably blocking the high levels of natural estrogens at that time. Uh, later in life, it does, uh, the, the soy products seem to be pretty neutral, but we don't see any hint of actually increasing breast cancer risk. So that's been uh, an important addition to the literature because there was, I think, genuine concern about uh, possible adverse effects of these uh, natural uh, soy products. And in terms of one of the, the blue zones, or one of our colleagues, Dan Buhner, Okinawa, a clearly a high intake of soy and arguably some of the best longevity in, in human history. Uh, right. Uh, that we do have, as you say, this, I think, valuable uh, human experiment, you might call it, uh, uncontrolled experiment. Uh, that at least gives us more confidence about the safety of soy because these populations that have consumed high amounts of soy uh, from early on to death uh, actually have low rates of breast cancer. So in terms of safety, that's important. Uh, whether how much that soy is contributing to the lower rates of uh, breast cancer hasn't been clear, but it, in fact, it probably is contributing somewhat to the low rates of breast cancer in, in Japan and Okinawa specifically. And, and from what I understand, sadly, in, in those in Okinawa under 50 who are taking on more of the standard American diet, the, the metabolic results are, are not too pretty. They're not, it's not a genetic advantage that they have, in other words. Uh, that's true. Um, although, interestingly, uh, in Japan as a whole, uh, they have avoided the obesity epidemic that the rest of the world has experienced. And that's pretty interesting 
that, as you know, the rate of obesity in American men and women is up at about 42% now and still climbing. Uh, and, but in Japan, even though they've been an affluent country for decades, now uh, the rates are, have not gone up at all in women. The, the prevalence of obesity is still under 5% in Japanese women. In fact, actually, there's been a slight decrease in obesity. And men, it's crept up a little bit, but still far, far lower than in the United States. Uh, and uh, there's interesting questions about uh, what is the reason for that. Uh, but a lot of it, it uh, is, doesn't seem to be about the diet per se, because uh, in fact, they have shifted quite a bit toward the American diet, but not all the way, uh, but more cultural in terms of restraint of eating. That in Japan, that uh, in parts of Asia, other parts of Asia as well, you're not supposed to eat until you're stuffed, uh, which is, of course, the American tradition. And uh, there is there, there is an element of dietary restraint, and also that translates into a general cultural restraint that uh, it would be very undesirable, uh, Japanese women have told me, uh, if they became obese. So there's a, a cultural norm that uh, does not foster overeating and gaining a lot of weight. Uh, it's very interesting. And uh, for that reason, they still are avoiding the worst consequences of the obesity epidemic. There, there are some that are emerging a little bit, but uh, they've, their life expectancy is still steadily going up. On average, uh, all, for all of Japan, they're living about six years longer than Americans. Uh, and here, life expectancy is going down. Uh, and unfortunately, it looks like we're actually nationally in a death spiral because uh, already the obesity rates are still climbing. Uh, we haven't paid the full price in terms of incidence of cardiovascular disease and uh, cancer rates uh, for the obesity we have, and we're adding more obesity. So that's a very, very bad uh, picture that we as a country are in right now. So, and that's a great point. I think the, the, the saying is hara hachibu, right? Eat till you're only 80% full, and that starts in, in childhood. The, the, the question you, you, the statement you brought up around fish, I wanted to just talk about fish and flesh in general. The, the overall for America, while there might be trade some for fish, the totality of flesh intake in, in, on average in general would, would need to come down, even if there was a shift up in, in, in terms of fish. So the question about sustainability is where I'm, I'm getting at here. And so the totality of fish pre fishing pressures would still reduce because what we're talking about is a, a ceiling level of amount of flesh intake. While some, if you're gonna have flesh, fish might be the flesh of choice, but in totality, there would be a decrease in flesh pressure, whether it's land or, or sea. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. In total, it would go down. Now, this, uh, the target number we had for fish was about two servings a week. That's consistent with the American Heart Association. Uh, and we're quite a bit below that at the moment. Uh, so uh, what I think, and as you sort of allude to, we're overfishing our natural resources. Uh, so to a large extent, uh, any increase uh, would have to come from aquaculture. Uh, and I think it does make sense that we invest in doing aquaculture well. Like most things, you can do it badly or you yes. can do it well. Uh, in principle, aquaculture is uh, much more efficient than land agriculture because the conversion of what we feed the fish to the flesh we get uh, is actually very good, uh, better than for poultry or even, uh, and much, much better than for cattle. Correct, Fan fantastic. And uh, I myself tend to, uh, I don't know if you use a resource for sustainability, I use the Monterey Bay uh, Aquarium Seafood Watch. Do you have a, a resource you use to try to, um, I, I tend to focus more on sardines and, and small feeder fish, but any, any thoughts? We're kind of going into what does Dr. Willett do? <laughs> you, can, you can sense that. How do you uh, go about sustain, uh, sourcing sustainable seafood? Yeah, uh, well, that, that the Monterey uh, criteria are generally pretty good, I think. Uh, the, uh, but I think it, what we really need are stiffer and, uh, controls and regulations over fishing. Uh, because it is one of these situations, if you or I do it right and somebody else, uh, it makes it cheaper for somebody else to do it badly and, and uh, be uh, doing destructive kind of uh, fishing. So uh, this is an area where we do live in a global commons and we really do need to uh, have rules and regular control. It is 
back to the law of the commons that uh, for someone, unfortunately, uh, if they just want to increase their own personal wealth and gain, uh, they the last fish will be caught and they want to catch it. Uh, so uh, we, we do need uh, regulation here to have sustainable fishery. It, we, we can, it's possible we can, some countries are doing a, a better job. Uh, even in the US, uh, the Alaskan salmon uh, fisheries are pretty well controlled and seem to be sustainable. Uh, so we, uh, it is possible to do this, but we uh, will need aquaculture on top of it. And as you say, uh, shifting more to small fish uh, is uh, one important part of that picture. Uh, it's interesting that Americans generally don't eat small fish uh, uh, like in the Mediterranean countries, as you know, uh, and there's no better way. Uh, some of the uh, anchovies I've had in Italy, for example, uh, uh, prepared in olive oil, just uh, grilled in olive oil, just wonderful uh, uh, flavors and tasting. Uh, but uh, we're not used to that uh, uh, in the United States. Unfortunately, uh, it would be good to have some restaurants serve those. Uh, they, there may be some liability issues, I think, that they're afraid of in terms of fish bones. Um, mm. uh, so I, I'm not sure why, but somehow that's not part of our culture to eat small fish. Yeah. I, I wish I could find some anchovies that weren't so salted here. I'm sure in, in the Mediterranean, you've got fresh anchovies, uh, not necessarily. Yeah, that, absolutely, different. they're fresh, no added salt. <laughs> right, well, not the ones you find on a pizza on rare occasion. Um, so. As we're segueing towards the end here, I wanted to just um, emphasize the, the the potential role for legumes and beans in terms of protein. And, and you know, in the True Health Initiative, we're asking for people to consider beyond just the amino acid content of a protein source in terms of its quality, its quality in terms of overall health and, and legumes providing low saturated fat, high fiber, high potassium in the entire package, while it might not be per bite as high in protein as a steak, the totality of your health uh, makes the, the the legume a really uh, overall uh, excellent, if if not ideal, and I would argue in, in many ways ideal, but never, I'll let you answer, uh, a really great source that we also don't leverage very much in the U.S. The lentils, beans, peas group is so, um, uh, I, I think, uh, scarce in, in, in the U.S. eating patterns. And as I've seen and looked at it, even in the Latino population, even though they may have higher rates of metabolic disease, their mortality rates tend to be lower. Whether that correlation with their legume intake is actually part of it or not, I don't know, but it's not hurting them like some doctors who are claiming that there is going to be lectins or whatever the, the issue is regarding beans. Your thoughts on legumes? Yes, that, that, absolutely. Uh, and there's a double win in this kind of shift because it, it means I'm not consuming, say, red meat, which is loaded with saturated fat and cholesterol. And it looks like other components of red meat that are also contributing to risk of diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So we would, again, we don't have to reduce that to zero. You can, if you really like a 12 ounce steak within our numbers, you can have that once a month on a sort of celebration basis. Uh, but, and then you have the gains from shifting to plant protein sources. Uh, uh, the, the legumes uh, do have fiber, uh, lots of other minerals and vitamins. I uh, do have an, enough protein if you make that exchange. Uh, so it, it is, there is a double win there. And of course, huge differences in environmental impacts. Uh, uh, it is interesting that in so many cultures, legume consumption has gone down. It actually was part of American culture in, in past generations. Uh, you, uh, Boston baked beans were famous. There's not a single restaurant in Boston where you can get baked beans that I've ever seen, actually. Uh, so. Uh, they sort of have disappeared in terms and in, in favor of animal source proteins. And of course, uh, beans are part of almost every dietary tradition around the world. Uh, in, uh, in Africa, wonderful flavored dishes I've had uh, with beans as the, uh, the center of the dish, but not, not alone. It usually comes with vegetables and lots of uh, flavors as well. Uh, Latin America, uh, it's beans and corn and maize in Mexico traditionally, but in Colombia with beans and plantains. Uh, so just look at almost every traditional culture. Uh, beans are a, a very important part of that. And of course that provides just incredible variety of uh, flavors, options. And we've lost almost all of that in our culture. That can of baked beans does not represent 
uh, enjoyable bean consuming. Uh, that, and unfortunately, that's about all Americans know of, of uh, beans. And of course, soy is a legume too. Uh, and it has um, some special nutritional components. It has more fat than most uh, other legumes, but it's healthy fat. It's uh, got a, a, a good amount of omega-3 fatty acids as well as other unsaturated fats in it. So uh, again, soy, I think, has some special properties that are good to include as part of the mix. And the wonderful thing is that uh, we have the world, literally the world of options uh, in terms of uh, culinary traditions that we can take advantage of, partly because we have a very um, mixed uh, variety of cultures in the United States uh, from, uh, that bring their traditions from all parts of the world, all parts of the world. And we also do have preservation and transportation mechanisms that can make it possible to have a wider variety of foods than our forefathers did. My wife's gonna love that you mentioned Colombia because she is from uh, Bogota. So, oh, okay. <laughs> thank you for saying that. Now, as we're transitioning to uh, more about Walter, first, first and foremost, uh, an, an admission from myself, I will, I will give as far as you, we talked about Starbucks and the world lives on fast food. One of the, um, and, I, and, and I'll, I'll credit a bit, uh, Michael Greger for pushing me further in this area, but I looked at, at Taco Bell's beans and their black beans hack actually have significantly lower sodium. So if I go there, I'll get a plain uh, 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 burrito. I just say, start from scratch. All I want are extra black beans, extra lettuce, extra tomato, extra onions, nothing else, no salt. It's, it's great. And I peel away as much of that, uh, of, the, of the toxic part. <laughs> you can actually end up with a very small <laughs> amount of the tortilla and a very high uh, uh, black bean ratio. So it's, you can do it, America. And, and another thing I guess I'll admit, and I'll have to, and maybe we'll get this on 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 record here. We we certainly would encourage if someone is willing to to instead of get salty fries if they're willing to uh, do an alternative at Wendy's uh, a plain baked potato. But take a walk afterwards. Physical activity we haven't talked much about, but that's a part of the story when it comes to healthy lifestyle. Is that fair to say? Right. You can eat all the potatoes you dig. <laughs> exactly. There you go. If it came out of the ground and you're moving, I love it. Um, so now trans, transfer, uh, transferring this into um, uh, some background as you know, and behind me here, it says Michigan State University. And while everybody thinks of you in Boston and credit to Boston, I love Boston. Now that's the second favorite city. It was a favorite city in America for my wife until I brought her here and showed her that Metro Detroit actually is an unsung hero and has a lot of history as far as Detroit goes. But uh, you, you have roots in Michigan, Wisconsin too. But if we could focus it a little bit on the, the roots of, of Walter Willett. Right. Um, I actually, our family has been in Michigan from the pioneer days. They cleared the land up in the upper peninsula, up in the thumb of Michigan, and uh, uh, became dairy farmers there. And actually, my cousin uh, has still owned a dairy farm there. But unfortunately, it's not a dairy farm anymore. It's like it looks like the rest of the Midwest has been flattened into monoculture of soy and, and corn. Uh, but um, uh, I did uh, go to Michigan State, uh, and uh, it's a great school. <laughs> and um, uh, we lived for a while in Madison, Wisconsin. It's the heart of the dairy land because my father did research on uh, improving the yield of dairy cattle uh, and uh, came back to continue that work at Michigan State University. Uh, so I grew up uh, going, uh, being part of 4-H clubs, and I won a lot of blue ribbons for my vegetables, actually, at our county state fair. Um, and then went to, went to Michigan State, but got um, more interested in health and decided to go to medical school. Michigan State did not have a medical school at that time, so I went to Ann Arbor and got my medical degree there. Uh, but it, um, at Michigan State did uh, continue on in interest in nutrition. I started in physics, but actually found that nutrition was more interesting, so I switched over to food science while I was there. But all the way along, I've been integrating the food science and nutrition into medicine and health as I went through my internship and residency. I spent uh, three years working in Tanzania at the University of Dar es Salaam where I taught first internal medicine but shifted over and taught public health uh, since I, had, uh, I actually had done my internship and residency in Boston at, at Harvard uh, and decided uh, to go back after Tanzania and do a doctorate degree in epidemiology. So I've, I've been there, but I was, uh, 
chair of the nutrition department for 25 years. I stepped down a couple of years ago because I wanted to work more on the planetary health aspects of nutrition. So it's been good. I, uh, I, but I've really uh, been able to still uh, integrate what I learned uh, uh, on the farm part of our family and uh, food science at Michigan State um, and my international experiences. It's really been a, a fun putting all these pieces together. A hybrid Spartan and Wolverine, a true man of peace. <laughs> That's fantastic. All right. So the last questions we have here: uh, What does a Dr. Willett? Um, what is what is Dr. Willett going to eat for lunch? Uh, well, it's um, summertime, and I may have a sandwich: uh, whole grain bread, uh, tomato, uh, and some fresh basil on it. I probably will put a little bit of olive oil on there. Uh, and uh, that's that's my summertime lunch uh, many days. Fantastic. And in terms of the physical activity component, because, you know, natural movement or formal exercise, whatever it is that you do, you're, whether you're a neat freak or non-exercise activity time or structure, what does Dr. Willett do? Knowing all of the data, we tend to really practice uh, what we preach, but it can be many different varieties. It could move from Tai Chi to resistance training. What, what does Dr. Willett do? Well, I, I, all the way along, I've tried to make it a point to be able to ride my bike to work. Uh, and the, the nice thing about that is that it's usually the fastest and most reliable way to get to work. I did it um, in Ann Arbor uh, there. And when I moved to Boston, I managed to uh, find a place to live where I could ride my bike to work. And it's again, it's nice because I don't, I don't have a parking space uh, and I go in all weather. And I, now there's some nice... Uh, tires you can get from Finland that have uh, spikes on them for the winter, uh, snow tires, basically. Um, uh, so winter biking is uh, a lot better than it used to be. Um, but uh, during the pandemic, I missed that because it, it did mean that uh, five days a week, I got back and forth. That, that was a, a very predictable amount of physical activity that I got. But I also like to do um, some longer term burns uh, that might be uh, a longer bike trip on a weekend during the winter. I really like cross country skiing. I do like outside activities uh, better than inside activities. You know, one lesson from this for sure, as you have mentioned the uh, like, uh, you may, may have even said love, but whatever the case may be, you enjoy your physical activity. And I guess there's one message we could say, find something you like or love to do, because if you don't stick with it, it's really just not gonna mean as much. Yeah, you're absolutely right. That uh, I that my bike ride to and from work is going to be the good part of my day, no matter what else happens. And um, I come over the bridge from Boston to Cambridge and uh, look down the river, and it's it's really nice. Doctor Willett, a professor of epidemiology and nutrition at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health, master of nutrition, uh, most cited nutrition researcher in human history, and a really wonderful human being. Thank you for dedicating this hour to noted. News of the day on behalf of the True Health Initiative. We cannot thank you enough, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Me. Well, thank you, Tom. And uh, thank you for advancing uh, continuously the nutrition agenda. We, we absolutely need that. Thank you so much. My pleasure.